Happy 2023 at Believer's Chapel, Sunday School class, Dallas, Texas. And uh, what a privilege it is for me in the providence of God to be back with you for another year, which leads me to begin, uh, first of all, to say uh, how appreciative I am of Mark and for his kindness to allow me to partner with him and teach this class. It's so very special to me because uh, I was asked by Dr. Johnson to start this class, what is known as the adult Sunday school class, back in 1979. And uh, so I'm so grateful uh, for the providence of God that allows me to be back here with you. And uh, also uh, so grateful to the elders to have the confidence in me to allow me to be here. Uh, the second thing I want to say this morning is I'm a bit nervous because uh, I am going to do something that I haven't really ever done in a long time. Uh, I'm going to give you something extemporaneous for at least a short period of time this morning. I, I really have uh, a lesson together from the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 26, uh, covering verses 2 through 12. And uh, I've really prepared for that. But I got up this morning and got a text at about 4.55 a.m. that Eric Alexander who has spoken here at Believer's Chapel, uh, has gone to be with the Lord. And I had an opportunity to be with Eric on three separate occasions in Oklahoma City and spent a lot of time with him. Thought so much of him that I spoke to Dan and said, we really need to get this man to Believer's Chapel which we subsequently did. And uh, Dan was reminding me even this morning that he drove Eric down to Dallas from Oklahoma City. And uh, he said, you know, as I was driving, uh, he was such an engaging person and I enjoyed our time together so much that I actually started slowing down just to <laughs> lengthen the trip. Uh, he was a man that left you with an amazing impression. Uh, he was a man like S. Lewis Johnson that marked my life deeply. And I was just with him a short amount of time. But he taught me some things that I want to share with you this morning. Uh, and so let me, I, I just threw this together uh, since five o'clock. So uh, let me begin with a text. He, I, I actually thought of this last, but I thought he would berate me when I get to heaven that I spoke and didn't start with a text. So I've put this text together five minutes ago. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 2. We always thank God for you and continually mention you in our prayers. And that uh, will launch me off into this short tribute to our friend. The, the first thing that I think that he taught me uh, was it was never where you start, but it's where you finish. Uh, he, he was always the misfit in the family. And it was Brother Ronald, who he named his son for, uh, who became a physician in uh, Glasgow, um, that had, that made the exemplary category in his family. And his mother would always say to Eric, why aren't you more like your brother? 
Uh, he was always late. He was pretty much of a misfit, always getting in trouble. And Ronald, his older brother, was the example. Ronald led Eric to the Lord. And the way that occurred is a lesson into itself. His life was so dramatically changed, Eric said, that it attracted me. What has gotten into you, he would say. What got into him was the Lord. And it's a reminder to you and me that the Christian life is the life of Christ reproduced in you by the power of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. Now, we get that first part, but we leave off the last clause there. Through the Word of God. So it is not stained glass windows and organs as beautiful as they are and choirs and choir robes. It is not incense and crosses but it is the Word of God. The knowledge of God in your mind. So Proverbs, as a man thinks, so he is. This Word transforms you. You become like Christ. And Jesus Christ was the most attractive man that has ever lived. I was just to, speaking to a, another young man yesterday and saying to him, see how crowded this room is? There are people talking in every direction, conversations going. And I said, if Jesus Christ were to come into this room, how long would it take? 30, 40 minutes? till it would be absolutely quiet. He would be speaking. And people would be asking Him questions. Because He was attractive. His personality was like a magnet to people. That is Christ that you're seeing in people. And that's what makes them attractive. The first thing I'd like to note about Eric and remembering his life is how devoted he was to his marriage. His wife was very ill by the time that I met him. And he made very careful decisions about where he would go and what he would do based upon his wife's health. He left a tremendous impression upon me how devoted he was to his wife. That's the beginning of a man of God. Be devoted to your wife, gentlemen. This is the first and foremost ministry that he has ever given you. It's the building block of everything and how sensitive he was for his time and his time commitment because of his wife's health. He actually stepped away from a lot of ministry. Second thing he taught me was much like S. Lewis Johnson and much like George Whitfield, he was not a man that wanted to be known. He was happy to be forgotten. Why do I say this? Because I have a colleague in Oklahoma City. He's uh, the president of American Bank Systems. He's a lawyer, but he's also a writer and an author. And like all of us who knew Eric Alexander, he specifically wrote him and said, I am, after much prayer, led to write your biography. I'm going to come to St. Andrews and spend a month. And Eric, in typical fashion, said, let me pray about it. And then let me consult my family about it. 
and wrote him back and said, no, I think it would be best that I'm forgotten. Amazing man. Here's the next thing he taught me. And this was really, it took some time to ponder it, but it made a lot of sense to me. Lasting friendships. Now, he uses the word friendship, not acquaintances. But lasting friendships are built not on common experiences. See, we have common experiences. I went through the war. I went through the depression. We played on the same team. We had the same difficult experience and that bonds us well his point was that doesn't build lasting friendships common experiences don't do that they eventually wane and people go away this is lasting friendships and he said that lasting friendships are built where you both share everything in common now, I began to think about that. And I thought of the people that I consider to be mentors in my life uh, who were much older than me, had no life experience with me whatsoever, but our common shared life was in Christ. And that didn't matter what their age was to me, nor what their life experience or their providence was in life. Those men and some women that loved the Lord, were close to the Lord, knew the Lord's word, were people that I had so much in life in common with. And really the things of geography and time and experiences didn't matter at all. What did we have in common? We had the Lord. And that was everything. Everything. If Jesus Christ is in you, He makes you attractive to other people. And that was Eric Alexander's. And here's his illustration for that point. I got this from Jim Boyce, his best friend. Boyce described it this way. He said, we were at a conference together in Europe. And I met this man, Eric Alexander. And before the end of the day and dinner, we had spent the whole day together. And I ended the day by saying to him, isn't it amazing? We are halfway around the world from one another, and yet we have so very much in common. Halfway around the world. Had never met at all. But they had so very much in common. What we have in common is Christ. And He transcends everything that we have. Build your relationships that way. And those will be your lasting friendships. Here's something else he taught me that I will never, ever forget. And so I put it in these words. Lasting victories do not rise or fall with circumstances. That means picking out the details until all is understood and comprehended. 
No, lasting victories are rather in placing all the what ifs aside and simply embracing a steadfast trust in the Lord for everything. Everything. Not what if, what, what, what if, what if he hadn't done this? What if he hadn't done that? No, just trust the Lord. Just, just trust the Lord. Now, I told this story, I think, a couple of years ago, but here's where I got that. Eric was sitting at his table of study up in his room in Glasgow at the time. It was 1968, and his wife, he could hear, come up the stairs, and she opened the door, and she said, Do you know a Martin Lloyd-Jones? Well, he said, Of course I know Martin Lloyd-Jones, but I don't know him, but I know of him. Well, there's a Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones on the phone. And he said, yes, and the Pope is ringing the front door. <laughs> and so certain that it was a friend that was playing a joke on him, he smiled and picked up the phone to say something clever, but it was Martin Lloyd Jones on the phone. We haven't met, nor have we talked, said Dr. Jones. But I would, in earnest, like to meet with you in London. So they determined a time and they determined a place. And he took the train ride from Glasgow down to London to meet with him. Now, Eric stops the story and he said, what you need to understand at this particular time was my ministry in Glasgow. He said, we would have a prayer meeting and you could fit everybody into a phone booth. Uh, take a shotgun and shoot it and touch no one in our meetings of the ministry of the Word. It was a dead place. And so he arrives and meets Dr. Jones. And he said, ever so the doctor, he goes right to the point. My elders, he said, have been praying for some time because they see that I need to find a replacement. I'm getting up in years and my health is beginning to wane. And after much prayer and much consideration, they have arrived at your name. That's the largest ministry in all of England. It's the largest ministry going on in all of Europe, of the conservative variety, certainly. Westminster, Martin Lloyd-Jones. His name is known everywhere in conservative circles. He's written books. And he preaches to thousands every Sunday in five separate places, all at Westminster. So he said, after being astonished, he said, I said the right thing. I'll pray about it. Of course you will. Of course you will. You know, in this little, obscure, know-nothing, dead-on-arrival ministry at St. George's Tron, of course you will. That's the right thing to say, isn't it? But Eric said nothing really changed. He told his family, but he did pray. He sincerely prayed. He prayed several times a day. He prayed on his knees. And he said, this is what happened. 
without exception, every time I prayed. I kept seeing the face of this old man that on the first lesson at St. George's Tron, when I came to the church the first Sunday, I watched him from the very back pew make his way stumbling and bumbling back and forth down the aisle until he comes up to me. And he puts his bony fingers up on my shoulders and his hands are trembling. And he said, I want you to know that I've been praying for over 40 years that God would send this church a man who believed the Scriptures. And today, he's answered my prayer. And Eric said, how am I to interpret that? That I see his face every time, without exception. And so the only thing I knew to do was to stay where I was. And so he took the train ride back down to London. He met with Martin Lloyd-Jones and he said that God has made it clear to me I need to stay where I am. Well, Dr. Jones wasn't very happy about that. You, sir, he said, are not listening to the Lord. You, sir, are a great sinner. Well, he took all of that in. But he called the train ride back to Glasgow the longest trip of his life. Willing and content to stay at St. George's Tron and pass up the largest ministry in all of Europe. His name would be known instantly all over the world. Why, Eric Alexander, this is the man who would take over for Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, and everybody knew Dr. Jones. And you would be in conservative circles, a, a big hit. But God told him no. And then Eric said, and this is what happened. The following Sunday, revival broke out in Glasgow. And a church that was empty was suddenly full. He said it wasn't full. He said, we didn't have enough seats. And people began to line around the walls all the way to the back and all the way to the side. An hour before the church service, the room was packed. And here's what he said he learned from that experience. There are no such things as strategic ministries anywhere. Anywhere, anytime, any place. You taking the Word of God to one person, you studying with them in some obscure place, some place is as important as what we have at Believer's Chapel in a packed auditorium. It is the Word of God being distributed. That's what's important. And we do it with prayer. And we do it because that is our calling. That's what changes lives. Eric Alexander is now home to be with the Lord. 
His wife died a few years ago. That didn't change his schedule. By then, he was in very poor health himself. But a man who was totally content in whatever the providence God put him in to serve him and to live for him. Now, that's the lessons that he taught me. And because he had been here at Believer's Chapel, I just couldn't let this occasion pass us by without thinking and pondering him in his life. The Apostle Paul said something rather remarkable, and it took me a long time to figure it out. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1. Follow me, he said, as I follow Christ. Now, that's a simple sentence, but it took a dunderhead like me decades to figure that out. It's not a following of theology. It's following a personality. He says, me, me. Watch him. Listen to him. See how he behaves. Listen to the way he talks to people. Kindness. Sensitivity. Fairness. Equity. All of these things wrapped up into that personality we now know that was converted on the Damascus Road. That's Paul. And if I were to say to you, follow me as I follow Christ, why, you would think I'm arrogant. But not that man. That man, that man is worth following. And so are you. And so are you. Let me say it again. The Christian life is the life of Jesus Christ reproduced in the believer by the power of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. You are a person of Great transformation. So, who are you leading? Who are you leading? A guy came up to me over the Christmas holidays and said, how do I learn to lead? I looked at him and laughed. I said, why, go to any bookstore in the world, you can find a hundred books on leadership. Leadership of qualities of Ben Franklin. Leadership qualities of, of General George Patton. Here's the leadership of this, the leadership of that. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, you lead yourself. First, if you can't do that, you can't lead anybody. The transformation has to start with you, yourself. Can you lead yourself? And why not? You have the power of the Spirit of God. The world is full of fools, but not you. You've been set apart sanctified, chosen by God, a people distinct and separate from the world. You are a priest. All of us are priests. And so, lead yourself, priest. Lead yourself by the Spirit through the Word and watch what He does with you. 
Because here's what he'll do. People will start listening and people will start watching. I see it all the time in families. Wives saying to these men, what? Who is this man that I married? Children say to fathers, what's gotten into you, dad? Business associates and the way you conduct your business, so different. That guy is really a different guy. And suddenly people start listening and watching. And then it happens. They're following you because you're following Jesus Christ. So that is your introduction to the book of Proverbs this morning. I just told Mark and Dan, I can't let this day pass by without remembering this great man, Eric Alexander, who is now with the Lord. So in the balance of the few minutes we have left, here is Proverbs chapter 26. I did prepare for today, honestly. And we are going to be talking about fools. We were all born fools, every one of us. But now no longer fools. Now we are children of God. And so the subject of fools and a fool's behavior. And here is lessons regarding him. Uh, beginning in verse 2. A fluttering bird as a flying sparrow, so an undeserved curse does not come to pass. Now, believers don't curse people. Fools do. That's what fools do. They're profane. They curse God. They curse you. They curse me. That's common to their language and their experience. Here's three. A whip for a horse, a bit for a donkey, a rod for the back of fools. Four. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you become like him. Now I've chosen to skip five and six and seven because we're familiar with them. Here is eight. Like one who binds a stone in a sling is a person who gives honor to a fool. Nine. A thorn bush in the hand of a drunkard and the proverb in the mouth of a fool. I've skipped 10 and go to 11. And the reason that I have chosen this one, although we're familiar with it, is because of its current application for our spiritual lives. It's somewhat refreshing. And finally, 12. Do you see a person wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. I doubt we'll get very far, but we'll do what we can. Let's start with two, the fluttering bird. As a flying sparrow, this is called the undeserved curse. Now, what you have to understand in the ancient Near East, when you spoke to someone, you were actually actualizing it. We don't do that. Uh, we speak in the abstract with one another. We say, well, may the Lord bless you. But in that culture and in that day, to speak a blessing was to mean that it is going to come to pass because I have delivered it to you. And so that is the context of the curse. The curse will be fall upon you because I have delivered it. And that's the mouth of the fool. And it has no form whatsoever, says the word of God in Proverbs, for any possible fulfillment. The curse is likened to a fluttering bird. 
That's the picture of the bird moving aimlessly. We look at our sparrows here in Dallas. Now, they move rather aimlessly. They dart and they jerk and they get up on the wires, but they're, they're not going coast to coast anywhere. They're very local. They just do this and do that and do this. And that's the idea of the bird here, the flying sparrow, the darting species, not known or understood for long flights in any particular direction. And you'd never see them in a cascading formation in the sky. And you go, wow, look at those sparrows. And we don't do that because they don't do anything but get on long wires together. Now, now, here's the force of the proverb. It's the predicate in the proverb. Here it is, does not come to pass. Literally, with an imaginary bird, the idea is that the curse doesn't land. <laughs> the bird stays in the air the whole time. That's the curse. It's not going to come to pass. It's going to remain in the air and cannot land because it's undeserved. That's the thought. And so let me give you a way to think about a person who might curse you. It comes from Psalm 109 and verse 28. It has three mays in the verse. Now, in the inspired language, that is a specific ending to a word. So it is more like a prayer and we understand it to be that way. Here is the fool to you or to me. He curses. Psalm 109, 28. While they curse, now here's the first petition. May you bless. Because you think differently. You are different. You're not the fool. He's cursing away. But your blessing. Here's the second. May. May those who attack you be put to shame. That God would be honored by your testimony. By the person that you are. You're not a fool. You don't act like a fool. You don't talk like a fool. Your life is different and you are interested in honoring God and so, may they be put to shame. May they look just as they are. Foolish and wicked. And here's the third. May. May your servant rejoice. They may curse. You are blessing. They are miserable. But you are happy. You're joyful in the Lord. And that's the proverb. Here's three. A whip for a war horse, a bit for a donkey, and a rod for the back of fools. This whole context is the things that are befitting a fool. And here is what is befitting him, a rod. The proverb compares two items created by men to the rod itself. Look, the top line opens with the first item, a whip, used, of course, to drive on the horse to a battle. The second item in line one, the bit, often used in conjunction with a bridle as well. Now, both figures together are the necessary equipment to do what? To teach, to train the horse, the mule, the donkey to conform to the rider. And that makes the animal useful for the purposes of the rider. Now, line two. You see that and in your proverb? Or you may have a so. That's very important because it puts all the items together in the proverb. And here are the items. The whip, the bit, and the rod. 
All the items are made appropriate for their purpose. And thus the force of the rod for the back of a fool. Proverbs 10, 13, a rod for the back of one who lacks sense. Brute force, strength, is controlled with proper equipment. That's the way you handle a wild horse, a donkey, or any animal. But how do you handle the fool? Well, here's what you do. Here's the equipment, handcuffs, tasers, the back of squad cars with a screen separating the front passengers from the two in the rear, rubber bullets, and the good old jail cell. That's the proper equipment for the fool. And so nothing really changes. Here's four. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you become like him. Tremper Longman is a fine scholar in the original language, and he wrote these words. The wise person must assess or determine whether this fool will simply drain his time and his energy, or should we speak to him and somebody be listening and gain from the conversation? I thought that was a wonderful explanation. The fool, line one, we all know, is nature is malicious and ignorant. Folly is his way. What is folly? Folly is his life. What is folly? Folly is a life that's unaccountable to God. I don't answer to anybody. I answer to my own heart. Well, that's desperately wicked, so you're off track from day one. Oh, uh, look at line two. You may have the word lest, L-E-S-T, or you may have so. I like lest. Lest is a wonderful word because it makes you think, ponder, consider. It's logical. It's leading us to consequences. That's the little small element in the original text that we translate lest. Always remember that. So let's stop, let's ponder, let's think logically. And here's the real heart of the proverb. To become like Him. See, that's what we don't, don't want to do. Become, a word of transformation. We've often talked about that. Transformation, identification. So before we answer the fool, what do we want to do? We want to lest. Do I really want to get out here in front of an abortion clinic and a person's holding a sign that's screaming at me and do I want to scream back? Holding my sign? I don't think so. I don't think that's what the proverb is saying. And before I answer this fool, what will be my tone? What will be the way that I speak to him? That needs to be considered. You see, here's the presupposition of the proverb. Not all fools need to be responded to. Matter of fact, the tenor of the book of Proverbs is, you see a fool, leave him alone. He's a fool. So, consider your audience. In all responses, all responses, what's important, what's important is honoring the Lord. God didn't save us to win arguments. Oh, that, that's really something very enlightening. I've never thought about that before. No, he didn't save you to do that. Here's a verse that I hope you'll take with you for the remainder of 2023. John 3.30, he must increase, I must decrease. 
You see, we're honoring Him by our lives, our lifestyle, by our speech, by our manner. I've been regenerated not to, not to flummox this fool, but to glorify God. So think about that. Lest, before you answer, that eats up the balance of our time. Let's close in a word of prayer. Uh, thank you, Father, for uh, the study of the book of Proverbs this morning. And thank you for the people that you have gathered here at Believer's Chapel. How rich we are in the knowledge of God and the things that He speaks directly to us for and about. Lord, um, thank you for Eric Alexander. Thank you for the, the privilege of getting to know him and actually in the confines of these walls to hear him. And even though now with you in unapproachable light, he still speaks to us. So we have a better way to live in the knowledge of God that's transformative, making us to be like Him. May the richest blessings as I pronounce them upon these people be actualized in all of 2023. Thank you, Father, for Your wonderful and amazing grace that brought us all together and we have so very much in common because it is in Him. Him. And we give you thanks and praise for that. In Jesus' name, Amen.